Hello quilters and welcome back. This is our last video in the series of the sampler quilt. And um, first I want to go through all of the blocks that we made, all 15 of them, just as a recap. And then talk a little bit about how I plan to put them together. So I'm starting with block number one. It was It's called Oblique. And here are the two uh, blocks that were made. These were our first block. And you'll remember we sewed these together. Well, we made these little individual units. And then we put a ruler on them and trimmed them so that they turned askew. And we got this wonderful effect. So here is block number one, oblique. Block number two was called pinwheel polka. And here are our two examples of pinwheel polka. And they are ready to go into our quilt. And pull them over a little bit so you can, maybe I'll just hold this and you can see them. So I want you to see the whole block. Okay, um, and in each instance, you know that I have my African fabrics. You know that I also have fabrics that I feel kind of keeps everything calmed down. Sometimes when we put African fabrics beside African fabrics, it can be a little bit busy and a little disconcerting and hard to really look at. Our eyes won't look at something that's too busy. And no one wants to go through the effort of putting a whole quilt together that no one can really look at. So here we are with our um, blocks. And in each of the blocks, I have put one or two of my grunge fabrics in there with the um, African fabrics. Block number three was called Crossing the Circles. And so here we are, the two examples of Crossing the Circles. And um, you'll remember we had to, we didn't really need to have a template for this, but I gave you suggestions for creating a template if you wanted to get this circle. And so that was part of the instructions that came with this block. But this is block number three, crossing the circles. Block four, sweet treats. And this was the block in which we had to look at how we cut apart a rectangle. Really, this one was quite interesting. And you can see a rectangle here. And then there's one there, one here, and one here. And so there are four parts to each rectangle. And once the rectangles were sewn together, we had to put them around a center square. And so that's what's done on both of these. And um, because I use the fabrics in different places, you get two entirely different effects. Here I did a little bit of fussy cutting so that I would get that blue, that it looks like a fan to me, but I would get that blue right there on in each of the corners on this block. This one I did not fussy cut. I just wanted to make sure that I had enough of the beige grunge to make sure things were toned down in this one. This one has more drama because the fabrics, the African fabrics are beside each other. This one has less drama simply because there are more neutral fabrics in this one. And that's another way that you can look at African fabrics and how can you either increase the drama or decrease the drama. And we've got two good examples right here. So this once again is called Sweet Treats. And if you have the book, you can find it in the book. It's um, block 541 and it's on page 278. Number five, 
was called film strip. Brought back some memories, especially the first few years that I was a classroom teacher because I used film strips to teach various aspects of lessons. And I'm sure there are others of you out there who remember teachers using film strips in school. And this one too is made up of little squares. And I love the fact that they go around a square in a square. And the same thing is happening here. The little squares go around a square in a square. And it was, it's simple, easy to, come to uh, construct and um, has a really nice effect, especially in these fabrics. So this is our um, block number five and it's called film strip. And of course, when these blocks are put together in the quilt, they're not going to be put together in numerical order or alphabetical order or any kind of order that I'm getting to them now. Um, they will be mixed up based on what I think I like best. And um, they will be scattered throughout the quilt. And the two blocks made from the same pattern will not necessarily be beside each other. I'm going to work hard to prevent that. This is block number six and it's called Chameleon. And I did it in blues over here. And here I used the red fabric with the beige grunge. And so here is Chameleon, once again, a simple block. Based on triangles, we get the effects that you see here with triangles. And uh, it's a matter of using those triangles, sewing them together to make a rectangle and then sewing rectangles together interesting construction uh, and an interesting little block. So this is block number six, Chameleon. Block seven is called Bar None and you can see the bars in the blocks. And <coughs> Excuse me please. Here we have block seven and once again right away you can see that one is not quite as dramatic as the other one. Simply because we used more African fabrics in this one than we did here. Here I only used one of my African fabrics and the rest I made out of the neutrals, the beige and the blue grunge. Here we have two African fabrics throughout the block and only the beige grunge. And so here again is another example. Do you want lots of drama or do you want less drama? Think about that when you're putting your fabrics together so that you can make the decision that will give you the product that you want. These are all 12 and a half inch blocks so that I will get a very big quilt. This one is called Texas Circle Around. Looks a lot like a churn dash, but the creator called it Texas Circle Around, so that's what I call it. And look at how you can get different effects. I love this one, it's quite different. The beige is on the outside, the, fa the uh, printed fabric is on the inside. Just the opposite here, and look at the difference in the effect that you get. Just amazing. Something as small as that can make such a big difference in the statement that a block makes. This block makes one statement. This block is telling us something altogether different. This one looks more like it's a square or a rect square. This one looks more like a snowball. You can see we've got these edges exposed. And so Think about things like that when you're getting ready to plan a quilt and you're picking your fabrics. The fabrics will help you tell your story and every quilt does tell a story. And so your fabrics are going to help you tell just the story you want. Do I want this story that is not quite as dramatic, that has a circular effect, somewhat circular effect, or do I want this story that has a little bit more drama but does have some places that calm it down. That's going to be one of the decisions you make as you design your quilt, your, yeah, your quilts and the quilt blocks you use in them. 
Then we got to block number eight. I'm sorry, block number nine, amazement. And we had to create what looked like a maze. Super, just super. Just look at that. Oh my gosh. And um, those of you who've been sewing along with me all along know exactly what I mean about this one. This was quite a, a challenge in putting these, stru these strips of fabric in exactly the right place to get the desired effect. But once you get it, it's just astonishing. It's just a beautiful, beautiful block. And here we have again, one of the blocks that has far more drama than the other one, simply because of the background fabric used here, as opposed to the background fabric used here. Makes a big, big difference. Then we get to block 10, which is called Jewel in the Pond. And here is block 10. And it's not quite complete right now because a button will go here and one here when the quilt has been quilted. I can't put those on yet because the quilt will be sent to a long armor and I don't want the buttons in the way when that person does the quilting. So I'm holding the buttons off, but in order to complete this block the way it was designed, there should be a button on top of the little piece right here. And the original block called for rickrack. Rick rack isn't something I normally use, but I decided to put it in here because that's what was called for. In this one, I decided not to use Rick rack. I made piping and I put a little bit of piping on the edge of the center square. And that piping, I think, just really makes those fabrics stand out. So you can, that's another thing to remember when you're making design decisions. Sometimes it doesn't have to be something big that will help your design to flourish and to really tell the story you have in mind. Sometimes it can be a small thing that will change your block just enough so that the story you want to tell is told. And that's what's happening here. And once again, you do see the difference in the drama, more African fabrics there fewer there. In fact, the same fabric was used here. And I did a, I didn't do much fussy cutting, but I wanted that loop in both of them. It's not in the same place and that's okay with me as long as I got that loop because I think that loop is dramatic. And I wanted that drama in this block because there's no drama here. Oh, very little, very little. I won't say no, but there's very little. And so I'm gonna take the buttons off again, put them away again, until this comes back from my long arm quilter. Block number 11. Infinity. No, 10 is amazement, jewel in the pond. Yes, 11 is infinity. And here it is made out of uh, different fabrics in a way. Here the main fabric is the dark green with a little bit of the red and the red on either corner. And here the main fabric is the blue uh, African print with that orange. And blue and red are part of the orange print. And so I sprinkled it throughout here. And so this is our infinity block. And um, let's see what it would look like if I did this. Just kind of curious. Doesn't change much. But in a, I, I do like the fact that the drama is about the same on these. This one is just a little darker than that one. But they both tell the story in the same way.
And then we got to Shifting Star. Number 12. And here is our Shifting Star uh, block. And the Shifting Star is down here. This part is the Shifting Star. I would think that both of these are pretty much the same. They're saying the same thing, almost the same way. Center is a little different. I decided to put that whole center made of the African print with the orange background. And here in the center, I only used two triangles of the African print and then two triangles of the beige grunge. So we've got a little bit more beige grunge in the middle, but we don't have more in the whole block. Notice that in this block, these triangles are not beige grunge, but in this triangle, they are. So you can make small changes in order to get a block to say and do what you need it to say or do. And don't feel that you have to always put the colors together the way you see the block designed. The color arrangement on the block by the designer was how the designer sees life. You are different. You see life entirely differently. So you put your colors where you feel they best tell your story. The pattern was created by somebody, but you don't have to use that as the end all be all. You can do with that pattern what you like as far as arranging your colors. And I would just hate that any quilter would feel that they were compelled to always use a pattern exactly the way they see it by the person who created it. If they created it and put it out in public domain, that means you can have at it. And you can sew your fabrics together in that pattern in whatever way best shoot suits you. Then we come to number 13, which is illusion. And these are quite similar actually, because they do have the same amount of beige. A little bit different here because these are warm colors and we can immediately see the difference with the warm colors as opposed to these cool colors. They do make a difference. And so you decide, do I want warm colors or cool colors? Or neither. Do I want all neutral colors? Do I want all dark colors? Do I want to use the same color, but different tones and shades of that color? And so those are your, your, your design decisions. And you will make whatever decision best meets your needs in order to tell your story. And now we're winding down Feng Shui, block number 14. So much movement and is going on in this block. It's, it just, it makes me feel like I'm at an amusement park and things are going on over there and over there and over there and there's music playing and kids running and laughing and all kinds of things are going on because there's so much life in this block with these fabrics. There is so much going on. Such a story is being told. This is a choir singing, actually. These are large, this is a large group of dancers dancing and they are telling the story as they see fit. And it's just wonderful when fabric does that for you and when you can put it together in such a way that you can just enjoy it like that. So this was block number 14, Feng, Feng, Feng Shui. And here is the one we just finished, block number 15, and it's called Christmas Cards. And I'm not sure why I made that one last, but I did, and maybe it's because Christmas comes at the end of our calendar year. I don't know. I wasn't thinking that one through. But here it is. And there's not a lot of difference in these two blocks. Actually, the only difference is that here I used the blue grunge, and here I used the beige grunge. 
ultimately they are basically the same because of the fabrics that were used. And so both of these these pieces, these blocks, are telling the story in the same way, but that's okay with me. And so one other thing now before I get started on what I need to do next, I'm going to put sashing between these blocks. I'm going to put a black sashing that's going to sew to one inch wide between each block, and here's why. The blocks are so beautiful on their own. It would be a shame to pile them on top of each other and not be able to see the individual beauty that each one has. But I'm using a very narrow sashing is I don't want it so wide that it becomes a major part of the design. It will be a part of the design. Anything you put on your quilt top is part of your design. It's a design element. I want that design element to be secondary to the blocks. So I'm going to make a narrow sashing. I am not going to use cornerstones. I'll get the blocks on together with the sashing. I'll organize the blocks and let you go along on that journey with me. I have a small house, so most of my layouts are done on the floor, part in the dining room, part in the hallway, but here's a layout that I think I like, and once I get the sashing in, it will be even better. So here's the way I'm going to put the blocks together in the sampler quilt. Here are the first three rows sewn together with the sashing. And the sashing is doing exactly what I want it to do, separating the block so that each block can shine on its own. And as I continue, I will show you the stages that I'm going through to complete my quilt sampler. The sashings have been added. You can see how the sashing separates the blocks so that each block can be appreciated for its own beauty. Now the quilt top is ready for the borders and the borders will be wide and they will incorporate the African fabrics so that we pull the African fabrics to the outside of the quilt. There will be some black in the border as well to tie everything together. Here we are, the borders are on, the corners are mitered, and now it's time to give it a good press and to call my long armor. I love it. It's busy, it's colorful, it's huge. I told you initially I like making big quilts. The borders, of course, made it much bigger. And uh, here it is on the floor in my dining room and hallway. Don't have another space in the house big enough to put it or to show it. But now I can look at all of these individual blocks. I can think about when I made them Think about the video in which they are contained. Oh my gosh, I am loving this. And prayerfully, you will see it the next time after it has been quilted and the binding has been placed on it. And if you're interested in mitering corners when you put borders on, 
I have a video on my channel that talks about borders. It's all about borders. And there are some really good step-by-step -step instructions for creating mitered corners. And here's one of the corners up close so you can see that. I do prefer mitered corners, a lot of people don't. But if you would like to see how, to, how I do this, please find my video on my channel that says borders, borders, borders. And it's all about putting the strips together and then sewing the strips onto the quilt top um, as one unit. And then you can miter it so that the miter goes neatly through all of the strips in each of the corners. This is our sampler quilt. Those of you who have been with me since the int introduction can now see what it basically looks like. And of course, when it comes back from the quilter, it will have changed one more time. Here's our quilt fresh back from the long armors. And you can see the quilting on here and it's just beautiful, just beautiful. And so now the only thing that's missing is the binding, the sleeve and the label. And I put a sleeve on all of my quilts, all of the quilters who know me and know me well, know that our quilts are going to last a far longer time than we are. And we don't want to think that somebody may want to display it down the line and they put thumbtacks in it or nail it or do something harsh to it. So I put a sleeve on the back of mine. So if anyone decides years after I've gone that they want to hang it, all they need to do is slip a rod through the sleeve in the back and hang the quilt. And so now here we are with this quilt that has just been quilted. And the next time you see it, it will be complete. Before we go to the completed quilt, I want to take a little walk back to once again share the resource that I used for all of the blocks that are included in the sampler quilt. And in the introduction, I did tell you that I had made uh, complete quilts from at least two of the blocks. And I want to share those with you now before we look at our sampler quilt. The first block that I put into the sampler quilt, I had also used to make a quilt. The quilt is made out of Stonehenge fabrics and here it is now. The block is called Oblique and I call this quilt Wonky Beauty because you can see all of the angles, you see the little pieces, you can see that the middles are turned in different directions and it is a wonky quilt, but it is also a beautiful quilt. Thus, it has its name, Wonky Beauty. And this is made from the first block that I put in the sampler quilt and that block is called Oblique. I wanted to show you the back of this quilt as well because I found this beautiful fabric, 108 inches wide backing fabric that looks like a map. Actually, it is a map of the Pacific area of our globe. And so there you can see the sleeve at the top. And as I come down the quilt, you can see some of the places that are shown as if it were a map. And here at the end, is the label and there it is wonky beauty the second block from the book that i used to make a whole quilt is called pinwheel polka and you can see right here that it has a pinwheel in the middle the pinwheel is the dominant pattern however when you see the quilt something else has happened here is my quilt made from the block pinwheel polka. The block is around each of the pinwheels that you see. They make up the center of the block. However, I think because of the fabrics that I used, 
uh, the secondary pattern became very prominent. And when you look at this quilt, the first thing you see is not the pinwheel, but it's the little diamonds in the middle. They're really not diamonds, they're just squares set on point. But I love the fact that that secondary pattern emerged once the, the blocks were sewn together. And when I was making this, I fussy cut the fabric that makes up the pinwheels and every pinwheel is different. I tried to give the, the pinwheels a kaleidoscopic effect. And so every pinwheel on the quilt is different from the others. This African fabric was given to me by a dear friend. I had been waiting for just the right pattern to come along to use it. And boy, does it work beautifully in this quilt. And I had named this quilt Spinning Africa. And once again, I found a backing fabric that needed to be seen. This is just so beautiful. So if I get up close, but it truly completes this quilt. And it too is a 108 inch wide piece of fabric that I had put on the back of this quilt. And you can just see how elegant it is, just how the colors play on each other, just simply beautiful. And it takes what's on the front, brings it to the back, and then makes it shine and spin and dance and do all the wonderful things that we want our quilts to do. And I'm glad I turned this over because the title is not Spinning Africa, as I had said earlier. The title of this quilt is Africa Spinning. And now we get to our sampler quilt. And I'm showing you the back of it first because I want you to see the beautiful piece of fabric that I found to go on the back. It's a Stonehenge ombre. And it has grays and browns and beiges and yellows as Stonehenge fabric usually does. And my long arm quilter was able to put the lighter part in the middle of the uh, back of the quilt and the darker part at the top and bottom. Did a fabulous job quilting this and just loving it. And I want you to see the label before I turn it over. And of course, this one is called Sampling Africa. And I even put some of the African fabrics on the label that are included in the quilt. And finally, here is our sampler quilt. When you saw it the last time, the binding had not been added, the sleeve had not been added, the label had not been added, and now everything is on this quilt, and I can call this one completed. I'm not sure how you normally treat binding, but I like to sew the binding on the top first with my sewing machine, and then I hand tack the binding on the back of my quilt so that I know it's going to be neat and there won't be any sewing machine stitches on the back that are not in the right place. So here is our sampler quilt. We have 15 different blocks, two of each of the 15, thus there are 30 blocks. And ultimately I added a 10 inch border because I thought those African fabrics needed to be spotlighted in the border. So that's what I did. I have a small white narrow border to separate the border from the body of the quilt. And I like doing that. Most of my quilts have either a white or a black tiny border to separate the, the big border from the body of the quilt. And you can see each of the blocks. Maybe they'll bring back some memories for some of you who have followed along with me as I 
completed this quilt. I am so happy with the way it has turned out. I've gotten lots of compliments already and I can't wait to enter it into a show when a show becomes available. But I just, I'm just enamored with this. Although I've read many times that a quilter's favorite quilt is the one he or she just finished. Thank you for sewing along with me and be on the lookout. Another set of videos will soon come your way.